Morning, dear Sangha. Today is uh, the third of November, two thousand and thirteen, in a still water meditation hall of the Upper Hamlet, Plumbly. Today we are going to uh, speak about um, the practice of compassion, and I would like to ask uh, Sister Dedication to come and tell us about the meeting we have in Stanford University on October 24th. The meeting was about compassion also and presided by uh, Professor Dutti of the uh, Department of Neuroscience in uh, Stanford University. We had a very beautiful evening in Stanford. Um, Ty offered the, um, an evening for students and faculty at Stanford. In particular, they have um, a compassion research program there, led by Dr. Bruce And um, So many of them have come with an intellectual approach to the study of compassion. And the, neurological basis for compassion um, in the brain. But many of the participants said that as soon as they entered the lecture hall, they could already feel the atmosphere of compassion created by the center. Um, we offered a guided meditation and some of sitting together before time for the meeting. They had an exchange uh, together. Although the truth is that I think Dr. Bodhi was so happy to hear from Ty, he only spoke a couple of times. Ty <laughs> was able to um, share the basis, basis of our practice of mindfulness and um, that we can cultivate compassion. And compassion is something that we can generate and cultivate. And and we need to do so continually. And I think this was very interesting for them because they may think of compassion as a channel in the brain or just some connections of neurons. But um, I was really sharing that this is a training and a practice that we can do um, every day. There's something in America called compassion fatigue. Maybe it's something a bit of a shooting countries, I don't know. But for those who send a lot of their lives to seem to suffering, they may run out of compassion in their hearts. And I will explain how we can continue to, to generate compassion with our practice of understanding suffering and compassion as well as compassion for ourselves. There is an opportunity for um, questions, and many students like to ask questions um, how we can offer compassion to those who are presently doing harm. Uh, how we can offer compassion um, to those who are greedy or selfish, like those on Wall Street, or how we can offer compassion to those who have narrow views and want to impose their views on us, like many of the radical um, Christian groups in the world. Um, there was a very dynamic part of Thai's talk, because Dr. Dodi was sitting on Thai's right, and Dr. Dodi's wife was sitting on the front row. So when Thai began to speak about the mantras, and he asked, are you really present for the one you love? And this woman started laughing on the front row. Mm. And how can you be 
love someone if you're not really there. And she started laughing and laughing and laughing. So there was a wonderful dynamic that Thai taught the, the mattress, not only to Dr. Doty, but also to his wife on the front row. And so I think this message went deep into his own life and his own heart, as well as um, all the work that they do at Stanford. The compassion program at Stanford supports many of the tech companies. Stanford is near Silicon Valley, um, and many of them consult Stanford for ideas about how they can develop technology that is more compassionate, including Facebook. And there were a number of uh, Facebook executives who came to the talk there at Stanford because they have been working with Dr. Doty's program to make Facebook interactions more compassionate. Let's get more. organization that uh, was responsible for that uh, afternoon, afternoon or evening? <coughs> afternoon, yeah. It's called uh, Sea Care. And the name is a Center, Center for for compassion. Center for compassion. And uh, altruism. And altruism. Research and education. Research and education. <coughs> so, beside compassion, there is also altruism. Altruism uh, is defined as the unselfish interest in the welfare of other people. But they also use the word uh, empathy, empathy. Empathy is uh, a very important uh, expression in uh, psychotherapy, Western said. Um, psychotherapy. Empathy means uh, experiencing uh, the feeling of another person as uh, one own feeling. And there, if the others suffer, and then you feel the suffering of the other, and you experience that suffering in the other person. So this is called empathy.
and the Center of Compassion and Altruism Research and Education uh, is organized uh, in uh, in the Stanford University School of Medicine. It was established in 2008. And uh, it is, uh, it belongs to the Department of Neurosurgery. Neurosurgery. And uh, Dr. James Doty is uh, a, um, a professor. The professor, a clinical professor of uh, neurosurgery. Chương mong giải phẫu thần kinh. James. This is the main idea. Uh, why science has made great uh, steps in treating pathologies of the human mind. Far less research exists to date on positive qualities of the human mind, including compassion, altruism, and empathy. Yet, these qualities like compassion, empathy, and altruism are innate to us and lie in the very centerpiece of our common humanity. Our capacity to feel compassion has ensured the survival of our species over millennia. For this reason, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University School of Medicine was founded in 2008 with the explicit goal of promoting, supporting, and conducting rigorous scientific research on compassion and altruistic behavior. Founded and directed by Dr. James Doty, clinical professor of neurosurgery, CCARE is established within the Department of Neurosurgery. To date, CCARE has collaborated with a number of prominent neuroscientists, behavioral, behavioral scientists, geneticists, and biomedical, biomedical researchers to closely examine the physiological and psychological correlate of compassion and altruism. Seeker investigate methods for cultivating compassion and promoting altruism within individuals and society through rigorous research, scientific collaborations, and academic conferences. In addition, Seeker provides a compassion cultivation program and teacher training, as well as educational public events and programs. Through their work at Stanford, they want to see that the practice of compassion is understood to be as important for health as physical exercise and health, healthful diet. Second, empirical validated techniques for the cultivation of compassion are widely accessible. And third, the practice of compassion is taught and applied in school, hospitals, prisons, the military, and other community settings. So that's very good um, intention. They want to do research uh, on compassion how to cultivate compassion and train teachers in order to bring the practice 
uh, into uh, milieu like schools, hospitals, prisons, military, and other community settings. It's very close to a uh, privileged uh, program of uh, 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 global ethics. Because in Plum Village, we also train parents, teachers, uh, and uh, uh, businessmen, and uh, politicians, and others on the practice of uh, peace, of uh, compassion, and uh, so that they can bring these uh, practice into uh, schools, families, communities, and so on. So very close uh, connection between Plum Village and seek her. But that is the only the intention, how far they can go, that uh, time can only, uh, only time can, can tell. There are so many questions asked by, uh, by people in that afternoon. The audience is about uh, 700 people and one-third of them are university professors. One-third of them is um, a consist of students, and one-third uh, invited uh, guest uh, of the university. There is one gentleman who asked this question. Compassion? Mm, that sounds weak. Because uh, in our civilization, it means the Western civilization, uh, compassion can, can be only for women. They have tenderness, they have uh, these kind of things, but men, they, sh- they should not be compassionate. Because as men, as a young boy, you, you are taught that you should not cry. You should not show your weakness. So in the Western uh, civilization, uh, compassion is un- understood as something not very strong, <coughs> not very masculine. And the answer is that, uh, no, you don't understand compassion because compassion can be very uh, powerful. If one is um, compassionate, one can be very active and one can sacrifice his life for the well-being of other people. And they did not make the quotation, but in the Lotus Sutra, the chapter on Bodhisattva Avalokita, it is said that uh, compassion is uh, powerful, as powerful as uh, the thunder. Tambi Nishamdam. That is from the Lotus Sutra. Mithe Jai Lotan The nature of compassion is like the thunder. And the nature of uh, loving kindness is like uh, the great cloud. Tu yi yu dai vun. So uh, in the teaching of the Buddha, Compassion is something very powerful. It's as powerful as the thunder. And uh, loving kindness, friendliness, is something immense, like a huge, big cloud in the sky, sheltering and offering freshness and light. And I don't remember exactly what he uh, said uh, during that afternoon. Just uh, we have to to listen back to the tape. <laughs> but uh, at least I thought they they told the audience about um, the ground of uh, 
of understanding that can uh, that can uh, that can be uh, the support of uh, the practice of compassion, and they spend a number of minutes talking about interbeing. Because they said that uh, compassion is made of non-compassion elements. It's like uh, the lotus is made of non-lotus uh, elements. A flower is made of non-flower elements. And in the case of uh, the lotus flower, uh, when we look deeply into the lotus flower, we see many uh, non-lotus elements, and among them, the element of mud. Uh, if there is no mud, there will be no lotus. And that is um, considered to be the meta-ethics for, for the practice of, uh, of uh, compassion. But without that kind of vision, you cannot really understand the nature of compassion. Compassion is made of non-compassion elements. And among these non-compassion elements, there is anger, there is uh, suffering, there is a suf- uh, uh, despair. And they made a connection, they showed the a connection between suffering and compassion. If, uh, if you do not understand understanding, uh, you do not understand uh, suffering, and then you have no capacity to generate the energy of, uh, of compassion. So um, they try to make it clear because uh, um, the dualistic thinking always uh, separates things. Uh, suffering is one thing, and compassion is another thing. There is no connection between the two. <coughs> but without suffering, there is no compassion. Like without uh, without the mud, there will be no lotus flowers. And they also mentioned that, uh, according to this uh, understanding, the kingdom of God is not a place where there is no suffering. And they made a demonstration. If uh, there is no suffering, and then there cannot be happiness. But the kingdom of God is supposed to have happiness. (laughs) But if happiness is there, suffering should be there, because the two can never be separated. And they use uh, an example of uh, the sheet of paper. A sheet of paper have, has the right and the left side, and you cannot take the right out of the left, and the left out of the right. They, want, they lean on each other in order to express themselves. So suffering and happiness are the same. Suffering and and happiness are the same. Suffering and compassion are the same. If uh, you remove suffering, and then there is no compassion. So uh, the kingdom of God is a place where there is suffering. If there is no suffering, and then there will be there is no happiness. Only the kingdom of God is a place where people know how to how to make use, how to make good use of suffering in order to create understanding and compassion. And if you go to a place where you see people ha- having the capacity to to transform uh, suffering into compassion, you know that place is the kingdom of God. But uh, in a place where uh, people are overwhelmed by suffering, and they don't know how to suffer. If they don't know how to make good use of suffering to, 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 to make uh, understanding and compassion, that, that place cannot be called the Kingdom of God. Làm sao có nghe được không? 
Người thì có cái gì đó, tiếng sông trao gì đó. And that uh, is something that shock people quite a lot because um, most of people are used to the idea that the kingdom of God is a place where there is no suffering. And according to the insight of interbeing, if there is no suffering, there is no happiness either. Because uh, both inter are. So interbeing is the ground of ethical, meta ethics. And then they use a, a, a easy example to show that when you look at, at one person, if you have the time to look, and if you have some mindfulness and concentration, you can see the suffering in him or in her. And if you continue to look, you see that person continues to suffer because He is not capable, he does not know how to handle the suffering. (coughs) He does not know how to suffer and to to handle the suffering in him. That is why he continues to be the victim of his own suffering. So far, no one has helped him to handle the suffering in him and transform it. That is why he continues to suffer. And as he suffers, he makes the people around him suffer, including you. Maybe he does not want to make you suffer, but because he does not now know how to handle the suffering in him, that is why his suffering is spilling all over, and you become the second victim of his suffering. And when you see that, and you understand that, Suddenly, you are no longer angry at him. You don't want to punish him anymore. Instead, you want to say something or to do something to help him suffer less. It means that you have compassion in your heart, born from understanding suffering. So compassion is something that is born from suffering, from understanding suffering. And it is uh, easy enough to understand. Compassion is born from, is born from understanding. And understanding of what? understanding of suffering. When you know how to look into suffering, when you have the time, if you are so, so busy, you cannot do that. If, especially when you are so busy making money, you do not have the time in order to look at the suffering and listen to the suffering and embrace the suffering. And the energy that can help you to look at the suffering, listen to suffering and embrace suffering is called mindfulness. Mindfulness of suffering. Mindfulness of listening to suffering, mindfulness of embracing suffering. So, listening to suffering, embracing suffering, bring about understanding of suffering. And when understanding of suffering is there, compassion is born. That is the mechanism of compassion. And the whole audience understood because it's easy enough. And that is why between compassion and suffering, there is a connection. And that is why in a place where there is no suffering, there is no compassion either. 
And as we know that the kingdom of God has love and compassion, we know also that suffering is there. Like uh, in a place where there is uh, there are lotus flowers, you know that the mud is there also. Because it's so clear that without the mud, no lotus is possible. That is, uh, that is the key point. So I spend a few minutes talking about the interbeing between suffering and love and compassion. And they said that uh, if you know how to suffer, you suffer much less. And you know how to make good use of suffering in order to create understanding and compassion. And these are two elements are the foundation of true happiness. Because a person who does not have understanding and compassion, that person cannot be happy at all. So happiness is born from suffering. (coughs) But you don't have to go and look for suffering because there is enough of suffering here and now. So you can make good use of, of, of suffering. And that is why you have to learn the Dharma. The Dharma tells us how to suffer, how to understand suffering, and how to generate compassion in order to be a happy person. Because a a person without compassion cannot be a happy person. A person without understanding and compassion is utterly alone, and she can relate to any other human being. And corporate leaders who are very, uh, very rich, very wealthy, can be very lonely. Even if they have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of money, but if they, are, they do not have enough compassion, they don't have compassion, and then they are utterly lonely. Happy, uh, money cannot make their happiness. So happiness is made of compassion, of love, and understanding. So they took um, the time to explain like that. And that is the first thing that uh, is shocking for, for the audience. The second thing that is shocking is that uh, they said that compassion should be directed to yourself first. But if you don't know how to be compassionate to yourself, it's very difficult to be compassionate to another person. And that is why you have to listen to your own suffering first. Your suffering carries within uh, itself the suffering of your father, of your mother, of your ancestors. And if you understand your own suffering, you understand the suffering of your father. And you are not angry at your father anymore. So understanding the suffering of oneself is very important. To have the time to be with your suffering. To have the time to listen to your own suffering. To have the time to embrace your suffering Tenderly is what we should do in the beginning. But uh, people in our uh, society, they don't like to do that. They don't think that it is uh, a pleasant thing to do. They don't want to go home to themselves and get in touch with the suffering inside because they are afraid that they were overwhelmed by the suffering inside. That is why most people try to run away from from themselves. They use uh, internet, music, electronic games, 
conversations, magazines, books, food in order to get for a while the suffering in them. And that is one of the um, characteristics of our civilization, running away from oneself. But according to the teaching of the Buddha, if you know how to practice mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of sitting, mindfulness of uh, walking, mindfulness of um, your action, your speech, and your thinking, and then you are equipped with that kind of energy, and, and then you can go home to yourself without fear in order to listen to your own suffering, to embrace your suffering, and finally to understand it. When you understand suffering, compassion is born in you, and you suffer less. Now you can help the other person, your partner, your father, your son, your daughter. If you have understood your own suffering, it's much easier to understand the suffering of the other person. And when you understand his or her suffering, you are no longer angry at him or her. Compassion is born in you. And you want to do something to help the other person suffer less. That is compassion in action. And you can do that for other people also after you have uh, been able to do it for him, for her, the nearest person to you. And that is the second thing that shocked the audience. Compassion has to be directed to yourself. Because most of people in the audience think that compassion is for another person. (laughs) And the third thing I told the audience that uh, as a community, you can generate a collective energy of compassion that can be very healing. As one individual, of course, you can generate compassion. But if you are 300 people, 700 people, 1,000 people sitting together, and breathing together, generating uh, uh, the energy of understanding of suffering and compassion, uh, understanding and and compassion, and then the collective energy of uh, compassion can be very healing for everyone who happened to be there in that zone of energy. So they show them that um, that uh, collective compassion is not an individual kind of energy, but it can be collective. And when co- uh, the, the, the energy of compassion is collective, it is much more powerful, and it can help uh, people to, uh, to heal. So I propose very concrete things, like in a hospital, if all the doctors and nurses and employees know how to practice mindful breathing, and getting in touch with the suffering inside of them and around them that will create a very uh, powerful energy of compassion that can help patients who come to the hospital to heal much quick, much more quickly. This seems to be something very new for them. And I also, I also propose that uh, the people in that organization Teachers, students, and researchers, employees all practice uh, mindful breathing, mindfulness of compassion, of uh, of uh, suffering, in order to generate uh, compassion together. And you should teach by by yourself, by by your way of life, and not just by giving giving a talk in a classroom, doing research and uh, talking about suffering to the students. You have to embody compassion 
and that people will believe, believe in the power of compassion. We had, uh, we have answered quite a, a number of questions, but there are many questions that are left uh, unanswered. This is one of the, the, the question that is written. Research has also shown that compassion has extraordinary health benefits. Not only does it reduce inflammation at the cellular level, but it also appears to be associated with a longer, healthier, and happier life. That is what the what the researchers found out. If you have compassion, you live a longer life. And compassion can heal you, uh, can heal things like uh, inflammation in yourself. From your perspective as a teacher, have you noticed this impact on compassion, on health and biology? And why do you think that happened? And uh, and we can say like this: when compassion is there in your heart, you are no longer angry because compassion is an antidote for for anger, and without anger. We are more relaxed. You are more pleasant. You are more peaceful. And that will facilitate the healing. And when you do not have anger, you can communicate with yourself much more easily. You can understand yourself much more easily and you can communicate with the other person more easily, and you can restore communication, and you can reconcile with him or her. Anger blocks communication. And that's why when you are able to generate compassion, it transforms anger, and then you restore communication. And if uh, communication is restored, everything is possible again. And compassion is the kind of energy that motivates you to do something to help people who suffer. That gives you an ideal, that gives you a meaning to your life. And that is why you live long, and so on. And pro, uh, um, compassion not only help heal you, but that is a kind of energy that uh, that can protect you better than guns, bombs, and so on. If you have compassion in yourself, in your heart. And then that energy of compassion will protect you from many kinds of dangers. Even uh, uh, violent people, terrorists, and so on. When you are compassionate and you don't react uh, in fear, in uh, anger, and that is why uh, you draw much less danger to yourself. If you are angry, uh, you make the people so, uh, fearful of, your, of, your, of, of you. And if they are fearful, they will attack you, being afraid that you will kill them or attack uh, them first. That is why compassion protects you and also protects the other person. 
And uh, in the Buddhist uh, teaching, the Buddha taught that uh, if you can produce compassion and uh, and uh, prevent a kind of fight to happen, you win. You win for both people. You win for him uh, and for you at the same time. That is a real victory. The governor Badia, before before he became a monk, under the guidance of uh, the Buddha, he was uh, very afraid because uh, he did not sleep well because uh, people are ready to uh, to go into his palace in order to steal his wealth and kill him. So even he was protected by many soldiers. He was always very afraid during the night. He is afraid that someone go into into the castle and kill him and get all his uh, valuables. But he, when he uh, abandoned everything and became uh, a monk, and sitting, meditating under a, at the foot of a tree, he felt so safe. And he's protected by by his compassion, his his uh, safety, because no one tried to uh, to kill him anymore. He has nothing. Uh, to lose. Uh, the businessman Anatta Pinika of the time of the Buddha, he was so compassionate. He helped uh, poor people, um, destitute people, destituted people, um, orphans and so on. And he had so many friends. That's why when uh, uh, he suffered. He uh, one time he he went bankrupt, but he did not suffer because all his friends came and helped him rebuild a business. So that compassion protect you better than than guns and uh, and so on and and bombs. Uh, we think. Really, we think that uh, if we have a strong army, a lot of uh, weapons, bombs, we are much safer. But in fact, uh, if you practice uh, compassion as a nation, you have other countries around you uh, to suffer less, and they will never try to have an idea to, to invade your country. When so far, not many political leaders are thinking of protecting the countries with the energy of ma- of, uh, of compassion. They they only think of uh, of nuclear weapons and so on. And if a country is fabricating nuclear weapons, it's not because it is belligerent, but it is fearful. We have behaved in such a way that they are fearful of you. And that is why they try to make bombs to protect themselves. So if uh, if politicians have the time to think, they may find out that um, practicing compassion is the best way to protect their own country. You have to be compassionate. You have to help uh, a poor country around you. And you've got a lot of friends and you don't have enemy. Otherwise, you make people around you, the countries around you, afraid. And they are looking for weapons in order to protect themselves. And in the case, you are less uh, safe than if you practice compassion. Another question. 
that was not answered during that session. Research suggests that compassion and the desire to help someone else who is suffering is innate. We see this behavior in primates, small children, and even in animals as lowly as rats. Bọn chúng sanh cấp dưới, cấp thấp cũng có, cũng có tự nhiên. On the other hand, we learn about adult capable of atrocious crimes. For that reason, it is sometimes difficult for people to believe that we have a compassionate instinct or that compassion is natural to all of us. If it is inborn, why then why do some people not display it? What are your thoughts on this matter? I think this question is uh, uh, put by Dr. Doty, that I did not have the chance to answer. <coughs> why, if uh, many people believe that compassion is something innate in us, everyone has a seat of compassion, but why there are people who do not display that kind of uh, beauty. They don't show anything that is compassionate. They are capable of, of uh, killing a child in order to, to take uh, the eyes, in order to offer, uh, to, to, to sell to rich people for transplantation. And we don't see any compassion in that act. They are capable of killing a person, uh, cutting off the arm of a person in order to get the bracelet. And in these people, we don't see any mark of compassion. How, how do you answer that question? So according to Buddhist psychology, this question is not difficult. Because all of us uh, have the seat of compassion but we also have a seat of violence. And our consciousness have at least uh, two layers. This is uh, store consciousness, and this is uh, mind consciousness. And in the store consciousness, there, there are many kinds of seats. And among them, a seat of uh, violence. Violence. Cruelty. And then there is a seat of compassion. And if uh, you happen to be born in a kind of environment where people are watering, are compassionate, and they water the seed of compassion in you. And then your seed of compassion grow big. And you become a compassionate person. At the same time, the seed of violence and cruelty in you have not been exposed to watering. That is why it remains very small. There is a cruelty in you, there is a violence in you, but the seed of violence and cruelty in you is so small. And that is why you are called a compassionate person. But if you live in another kind of environment where nobody knows how to water the seed of compassion, that is why the seed of compassion in you will be Small, very small. And if uh, you uh, you watch a lot of fear, violent films and uh, uh, live in a very uh, violent environment, and people water the seed of anger and violence in you, and then you become a violent person. And people see the violence in you and People don't see compassion in you because the seat of 
compassion in you is so small. So you cannot say that it's not in you, it's not innate. It is innate, but it has no sense to be water. And that is why the practice of mindfulness consists in watering the seed of understanding and compassion every day uh, so that it will it will uh, establish uh, restore a balance between compassion and violence and then the practice of um, uh, true uh, diligence help you not to water the negative seed and uh, and you can reduce the seat of violence to a minimum and uh, increase the seat to compassion so that you become a compassionate person. So the answer to this question is that it depends on the environment, it depends on the practice, it depends on the state of, um, uh, of uh, cons- uh, state of uh, wa- uh, watering. And it depends on your way of uh, consuming. If you consume a lot of items that has uh, violence, anger, and fear, and then you become a violent person. And if you refrain from consuming these items, and then uh, your seed of violence, anger will not grow every day. And that is the object of the fifth uh, mindfulness training, uh, mindful consumption. Because there are items of consumption that can water the seed of compassion. But there are items of consumption that water the seed of anger and uh, violence uh, in you. You become a violent person. So in your relationship, you should try to talk to your partner about this kind of practice. You have a seat of violence in you and a seat of compassion in you. You ask your partner to water only the seat of violence, out of uh, compassion, <laughs> and not the seat of violence. And you promise him or her to do the same. You do not water the seat of violence in you by yourself. And you ask your partner not to water the seat of violence in you. And you, pro- and you ask your partner to water the seat of, uh, of uh, compassion in her every day, and you promise to her that you will help her pro- watering the seat of compassion in her. Because as compassion grows, you become happier and happier every day. Happiness is in function of uh, compassion. So you have to sign a pact, a treaty of compassion, of love with your partner. This is another question. When scientists ha- have asked what makes a person compassionate versus not, there are a number of factors that can come into play. One is a feeling of similarity with another. The more similar we feel to another, the more likely we are to help them. It means that um, the person who asked the question believes that if you are similar to the other person and then you you can allow compassion to be born much more easily. But in this teaching and practice, it is, uh, it is expressed in a much, much clearer way. If you have suffered, if you have suffered the same suffering that the other person is undergoing, and then you understand better. before, you can recognize the suffering in the other person in this present moment, and suddenly compassion is born. And that confirms what I has said before, that if you understand your own suffering, you can understand the suffering of the other person much more easily.
And that is the, the answer to this question. If you, you have uh, experienced hunger, and then you, you know the suffering of not having anything to eat in several weeks in a row. And that is why when you see people, uh, you hear people having nothing to eat, compassion is born in you very easily. So that is called in this question similarity. Well, similarity is not uh, the right uh, the right word. The right expression is that you have suffered that suffering. That is why you can recognize it in the other person, and that make compassion born uh, easily. Another is whether one person is in need of help or whether many people are in need at all at once. When you see a person in need of help, it's more easy for you to be compassionate. But if, if you see many people in need of help, you are overwhelmed and compassion is not born in you. If one people need help, we are more likely to feel compassion for them than if 20 people need help. The theory is that we may feel overwhelmed in that case. And this is a question put forward by an academic uh, person. <laughs> the answer is that, uh, first of all, maybe compassion in you is not big enough. <laughs> the second the second answer is that you do not have a Sangha behind you. Because with, with a Sangha behind you, around you, you are much more powerful in helping people. And that is why compassion should be cultivated not only as one person, but, but also as a community. That is the answer. But uh, they did not have the time to, to answer this question. And another example of when people do not act with compassion is when no one else is helping. In that case, they are more likely to ignore the person in need just like anyone else is. In your experience, what are the hindrances to compassion? When are people compassionate versus not? The answer is the same, because uh, the seed of compassion in you is not strong enough. There, there is compassion in you, but not strong enough. And you need someone to water it. It may be that the seed of compassion has not been watered. So if someone is trying to help, uh, his uh, or her action of helping is a kind of uh, watering. Your own, your own, uh, your own uh, seat of compassion. When you see someone is helping, uh, the seat of uh, compassion in you is water, and it manifests as energy, and that is much easier for you to do the same. But if you are used to the work of compassion, you'll be the first one who do it in order to encourage other people to, to do so. The answer is that uh, the act of compassion needs support. And the act of compassion can water the seed of compassion in another person. And compassion is something that can be contagious. It's like uh, when when you uh, when when you uh, you sell an auction. If you are alone, you will not pay that uh, for that high sum of money. 
But if other people are trying to buy that and paying a higher, higher price, and then the, the, the seat in you will water, and you are able to pay another uh, a, a higher price for the auction. And that is why it's, uh, it's uh, contagious. And that is the, the effect of the collective uh, consciousness. It con- connects energy. If uh, someone make a compassionate action, make a donation, and then people uh, who are present uh, will be moved because of that act of uh, compassion uh, water the seed of compassion in you, and you are motivated by desire to make a, a donation also. So that is why uh, compassion can be described as contagious. So the hindrance here is uh, that you need a collective energy. You need a kind of environment that water uh, the seed of compassion in you. And you need uh, to rehearse uh, and um, you also need uh, the insight of interbeing because uh, with the insight of interbeing you see the suffering of the other person as your suffering and making the other person suffer less, you suffer less. And that is why uh, the one who makes a compassionate act uh, get a reward right away. You do something good and help people suffer less. You are happy. And doing good for another person is doing good uh, for yourself. Another question. Research suggests that when faced with a person who is suffering and need, some people feel very distressed. The level of discomfort leads them to want to turn away from the situation. Why do you think that is? And what is some advice you might have for people who would like to become more compassionate but who feel extremely distressed and incapacitated when faced with suffering? When you see a person who is suffering and need, you might might feel distress. And that discomfort can lead you to turn away from the situation. The answer is that um, when, when you see the suffering in another person. That turn on the suffering in you. Suppose uh, if you uh, if you had been abused as a child And uh, if you have not been able to transform that suffering in you, so when you you hear a person telling you the suffering, her suffering of being abused as a child, you don't feel comfortable. You feel that the suffering in you is turned on, and you try to run away. We hear that uh, Oprah Winfrey, one time when she was interviewing a lady, and since that lady was talking about her suffering about being abused, and at that moment uh, Oprah Winfrey uh, was about to collapse as an interviewer, and she wanted to stop the cameras. She, she didn't want the people see her collapsing uh, during an interview. That is because uh, she had the same kind of, uh, of suffering, uh, of uh, 
having been abused as a child, that she has not transformed that suffering, and that's why when she listened to the story of suffering of the other lady, she nearly collapsed. And that is why the answer is that if you turn away from the suffering, not because you don't have compassion, but because you have not been able to transform the suffering in you. If you don't help yourself first, it's difficult to help another person. Compassion has to be directed to yourself first, to heal you, and then you can help heal the other person. And that is the answer to this question. We have to learn how to water the seed of compassion every day. We have to be nourish ourselves with joy and happiness every day. We have to learn how to transform our suffering. And then we are we'll be strong enough to help another the person who suffer and who needs help and we will not turn away from him or from her. Another question. We often hear of people in the helping professions developing something we call empathy fatigue or compassion fatigue. Having devoted many years to serving others, they feel exhausted, worn out, and often leave their profession. Is there such a thing has too much compassion? What are some ways that people can prevent such burnout? Can too much compassion be bad for you? It's not that uh, you have too much compassion, but you have run out of compassion. Because compassion is something that should be nourished every day. And psychotherapists, they have to to know the practice. If they only spend their their day listening to suffering, that's not good for them. Because that is the kind of food she she, she feeds herself every day. Just listening to suffering. And that's why a good psychotherapist should learn how to to generate a joyful feeling, a happy feeling every day, several times. She should know the art of happiness. And she should live in a community where people know how to create joy and happiness and to nourish themselves with uh, joy and happiness. If she lost the balance, and then she will burn out. She feels something like compassion, fatigue. Secondly, she has to learn how to transform the suffering in her. So there are two things she ha- has to, da- to do. First is to nourish herself with enough joy and happiness in her daily life. And second, she should know how to handle to suffer and transform the suffering in her. If she knows how to do these things, she can, she can continue to, uh, to keep the balance and she will not be burned out. And she will not uh, uh, experience something that people call compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue, it means you run out of compassion and empathy. And so the answer is that uh, you lose the balance. You don't know how to feed yourself with joy and happiness. You don't know how to transform yourself. So you, don't, you, you cannot continue helping people for a long time. The next question. Recent research suggests that more rich people are, the less willing they are to help others. Rich people are not compassionate. Compassionate people cannot be rich. 
in the study, in one study, the data show that higher income individuals actually donate a smaller percentage of their annual income than lower income individuals. Why do you think that is? Because the rich people donate less and the poorer people donate more. Why is that? Why do you think that is? I know of people who are afraid of going to Africa and Asia. And these people are young enough. They have an idea about Africa and Asia. They have the idea that uh, people over there are very poor and they suffer a lot. And if they go there, they have to be in touch with the suffering there. And that will make them suffer. But these people do not know that uh, the poor people, (laughs) sometimes they suffer much less than the rich people. If you go there, you see. They can be happy with uh, very little things. And they laugh much more than people who are rich here. They are poor, but they, they, they live in such a way that uh, anything, at least any small thing can make them happy. And they are more relaxed. And those people who are afraid to get, get in touch with suffering be because, because of that idea in their head. They want to be safe because they know that uh, if they get in touch with suffering, they will be overwhelmed by suffering, that is fear. So the rich people, many of them are afraid. But that is uh, in, the heart, in the head only.